I count myself extraordinarily privileged to have had the chance to have served at the heart and centre of a reforming government. I have to tell you, it wasn't much fun. I remember in 1996, Howard nominated five of us and said, you're going to be a razor gang, you're going to turn the country's ever-increasing deficits into surpluses and we're going to pay back the debt. Five of us. It was the most difficult and agonising work I've ever been involved in. The first 14 months in government, we ran two budgets because we realigned the budget times. They'd been moved to later in the year. Uh, we brought them back to May. Five months locked up from around 10 o'clock every morning till 11 o'clock every night in a little bunker room called the Cabinet Room, trying to find savings to put your taxpayers' dollars back where they ought to be. We spent uh, three hours debating a $90,000 rat baiting program on Lord Howe Island. That's how finally we went through things. We became very unpopular. I know how much courage it actually takes to stand in the face of popular sentiment when you're doing things that you believe to be in the nation's interest and others don't. But no one would dispute now, would they, that what we did in government was high quality stuff. We've got a little graph at the end of this presentation. Uh, can we pull that down, sorry? How did that get up there? <laughs> Magic. Push the I pushed the button. Next, previous. Oh, there we go. Michael, back to yours. Um, uh, and then over and above being at the heart of government and the economic reforms that saw a strengthen of the economy, employment rising, real living standards rising for the first time since the 1970s, all of those sorts of things. Is there any way at all, look, you're stealing my thunder. Can we just flick them off? Just for a few minutes. <laughs> Is that possible? Yep. Thank you. That's much better. Especially the name at the top. Um, and out of all of that, fell the chance to secure better water property rights for farmers, for an example. To establish programs like farm biz and farm management deposits, tax-linked saving devices for farmers to help them even out the ebb and flow of rural income. Significantly, in the context of the current debate about water quality in the gas sector, I was able to spearhead the allocation of very large amounts of money to capping and piping the Great Artesian Basin open flowing bores, thousands of them across the country, which had depressurised two thirds of the basin. That is not a legacy that I would want to trash, you'll understand. So I'm thankful for those opportunities and for many more. And I have to say to you, I'm essentially a very private sort of man, quite shy, believe it or not. Uh, and it was my great hope that when I left public life that I'd helped in some modest way to not only achieve better outcomes for landowners in this country, but more importantly, to raise the level of dialogue surrounding the importance of both agriculture and resources to the Australian economy and the Australian way of life. I've been out of public life for some time now in many ways. I'm thankful to have been shielded from the public spotlight, thankful to be back in the solitude of the Australian bush. So I have to say to you, it's uh, with some hesitancy that I accepted today's invitation to leave the farm again, to come and address you. I don't make a habit anymore of talking publicly about issues so bitterly contested and riven with political debate, as in particular we've seen with the unconventional gas sector in recent times. But I came because I'm concerned, I'm very concerned. I'm concerned about the quality of discussion that's occurring around the issue of strategic land use. I'm concerned about the entrenched positions that people are occupying. And I'm very concerned about the level of misinformation that exists and which is so hard to correct. For the resources sector to work together effectively with the farming community, we need a spirit of genuine trust and cooperation. We need to not just speak up about our own apprehensions, our own fears, our own interests, but to listen openly to the concerns and interests of others. These are, in fact, the qualities that have always characterised this nation in times of trial, even of danger. And I've long held the conviction that a calm, civil discourse is the only way of arriving at outcomes that are in the national interest that will build trust, that will take us forward. And the more controversial the issue, the more important, not less, the more important that both sides 
engage in honest and open debate. And it's my hope, Kerry, that I can contribute in some modest and small way to that uh, discourse today. So in defining the problem, let me actually start on the issue of food security in a resource-constrained world. And the first point I'd like to pick up on today is the claim that gas extraction threatens agricultural productivity and, in turn, food security. You will have heard it, and it's been used very emotively and in a way that has many people very concerned. So it's a claim that is of vital importance to unpack. I do so as a farmer, not as someone in the resources sector. I had four years of chairman of an emerging gas company. I was asked to chair it because it was in my electorate and be out of my interest in regional development, jobs and energy policy and its importance to agriculture. Here's the irony of it, isn't it? I actually come at this from exactly the opposite position of many of my fellow farmers. I actually think the resources sector and the discovery and development of new hydrocarbons is critical to farming in the future. And that was how I came to be involved and accepted the invitation to get involved. I am no longer involved today. Santos bought the company out completely, lock, stock and barrel. Uh, and as I stand before you, I have no shares or pecuniary interest in any way, shape or form in any resources company. Now let me though, having said that, say to you that there are in this debate three important trends to notice. First, the population of mankind on this earth is growing rapidly. Our best estimates predict that population growing to roughly 9.3 billion people by the middle of this century. Secondly, there is an important dietary shift taking place as a middle class emerges in India and China and other increasingly wealthy states with the income to afford better food. The World Health Organization projects that demand for meat, as an indicator of this, will increase by 200 million tonnes by 2050. These factors combined lead us to a reality in which we need an increase of total food production of 70% by 2050. In fact, many experts say that we will need to double the amount of food we're currently producing if there is to be a decent diet for every soul on the planet. This poses staggering challenges and it is furthermore seriously exacerbated in light of the third trend that I want to draw your attention to. We are rapidly losing agricultural productivity, uh, productive capacity. Between ongoing urbanisation, disturbed weather patterns, and a concerning allocation of agricultural capacity to non-food production, such as biofuels, we have very little space to expand the amount of land we use to service the increasing demand we face. We can see the beginning of where these trends will take us already. World grain so uh, reserves are precipitously balanced. Food riots are in danger of erupting in 33 countries around the world. Roughly 100 million people have been driven deeper into poverty as a direct result of rising food prices in the last 18 months. And the economic and humanitarian toll of this problem will only grow unless we act decisively. But you might be saying, what does any of this have to do with agriculture and the link to resource extraction? For many, the link is counterintuitive. We were talking about this last night over dinner. People just don't see it. They don't get it. What's the linkage? What's the point you're making? It is beyond reasonable debate that the miracle of technology has been the handmaiden of agriculture in feeding the burgeoning multitude over the last 150 years. Farmers have responded to supply constraints by innovating and by building industrial scale machinery to revolutionise the volume with which we can produce and harvest agricultural product. A single gallon of fuel used in harvesters, reapers, tractors can replace up to 100 man-hours of old-fashioned labour. One gallon of diesel replacing 100 man-hours of old-fashioned labour. And that's not to mention the crucial contribution of oil to fertilisers, pesticides and the plastics that are so critical now to those who produce food. But here's the important part. Both our existing technological capability and all conceivable technological innovation in the short to medium term are dependent upon a supply of cheap and readily accessible fuel. And we're running out of it. 
Both oil and coal supplies are finite. We're currently receiving the mother of all price signals, as Jeremy Grantham of that GMO newsletter uh, points to, uh, uh, in relation to oil. A price signal that tells us that ready access to cheap oil is not something that we can afford to be lackadaisical about at all. Now, if I could have those slides, what have we got next? Next one. I've got these buttons here, next. Here we go. Um, uh, this, uh, this graph just reflects something that you'll be all very well aware of. Uh, it is that uh, discoveries of oil have been tapering off for many, many years relative to production uh, and to demand. You then have to add into that political volatility. The next one, if it's come up, no, is from Jeremy Grantham's GMO Commodity Index. He points to what he calls the great paradigm shift. We've seen long-term declines in the cost of inputs uh, and of produce of almost every description, but now we've got a dramatic change in the paradigm that relates to the supply of cheap oil. Now I'm going to ask if we can just drop those again. Can you go back to that lovely earlier one we had? That's it. Great. Thank you. So all of this sets up the fundamental context for a discussion about land use. With a growing population demanding more and better food in a situation where we're running out of the land and the water we need to expand agricultural input and the hydrocarbons we need to improve agricultural productivity, I believe we are teetering on the edge of a cliff. And herein lies my essential belief. If we don't find a sustainable solution to the declining availability and the rising prices of hydrocarbons, our agricultural industry and its ability to feed and clothe people will be compromised more than it ever would be by concessions of land access to the resources sector today. Policy alternatives to this problem so far is not engaged in. It's not debated publicly. It's not understood. So far, they've taken the form of the politically convenient and the expedient. They don't require compromise. We can exploit the point of least resistance and buy time for another government, another day. That would be all too easy in the current parlous uh, political environment in this country and indeed right across the West. Renewable energy and biofuels are two obvious examples, promoted wildly beyond what they can ever actually achieve for us, yet people buy it. Renewable energy will, for the foreseeable future, lack the capacity agricultural producers require. Not only agriculture, but I speak as a farmer. Solar energy is a long way off being able to power a tractor. And wind energy, to the best of my knowledge, is not likely to be turned into fertiliser in the near future. And can I say that most biofuels, I'm convinced, present real problems. And in the end, will simply not deliver anything like the volumes of fuel that we needed, even if the policies are aggressively pursued right across the world. Can I say to you, I have other problems with it. I personally have difficulty with the idea of diverting productive agricultural land into producing fuel for commercial jetliners rather than food for people's stomachs, when it isn't necessary to do it. It does say something, though, doesn't it, about the importance we attach to energy that we will prioritise producing fuel over feeding people. And one of the great problems that's very easily overlooked, a potentially really serious global problem when it comes to feeding people, is that if this idea that we can grow fuel rather than food becomes a necessity or catches on in the developing world, and we end up with small farmers everywhere devoting a plot of their best land not to food production, but to fuel production to drive their rotary hoe or their little tractor or their stationary pump engine, the likely outcome will be catastrophic in terms of our ability to feed people. So I don't see the biofuels or the renewable sector, either of these solutions, supported as they are by the policy arrangements of much of the Western world at vast and distortionary and unrealistic expense at a time when most Western countries cannot afford it. I do not think they provide an answer to our energy demands in the volume we need, of the type we need, or within the time frame that we need. But the question of food security isn't a question we can walk away from. 
We can't do it. We can't say it's too challenging. We've got to find the answers. And that's where I think the energy revolution that we're now talking about, the discovery of massive reserves of unconventional gas and their development, in a sense, is postponing indefinitely peak oil. It's a substitute for, it's an alternative to, it can be used in place of, you know the story. And the most unexpected development in the last few years has been the staggering development of shale gas and condensate in the United States. I think it's a very interesting development indeed uh, and is already having profound implications. Notwithstanding controversy over some of the related issues, fracking for example, uh, you know the film Gaslands, you've all heard of that, and it frightened the living daylights out of some people and a lot of people have not understood firstly that you know, it's simply not relevant for Australia. And secondly, technology advances very rapidly. You know, when motor cars first came out, there was a very high chance if you drove around in one, you'd get killed. But well, they've advanced, just as your sector has advanced. And it's quite evident now that the drilling techniques that are being widely used in America are there to stay. They're not going to go away. And so the industry is revolutionising America's energy outlook and therefore the world's. Indeed, the International Energy Agency believes that America will shortly become, once again, the world's major producer of hydrocarbons. Now, those new sources of hydrocarbons will refuel a US manufacturing sector and dramatically reduce costs for farmers. For example, new nitrogen fertiliser plants being built all over the United States, taking advantage of newfound, freely available and low-cost gas will dramatically reduce American farm input costs and guess what? Push up food productivity. That's what it'll do. The very opposite of what we sometimes hear in the leafy suburbs. And in one or two radio announcers shacks around the country as well. Isn't it strange how sometimes black can be painted as white and white as black? The good professor knows something about that. I salute his courage. I really do. The way in which some people try to silence alternative views in this country is a disgrace. Now I want to say as an Australian farmer who has a long term interest in policy for agriculture, my major sort of occupational interest in this country I suppose, do you know I think we would be mad to deny our farmers the same opportunity? That's what I think. As the Vice President of the National Farmers Federation, Duncan Fraser, acknowledged in Adelaide just last week, there are farmers and farming communities in Queensland and in New South Wales now, recognising that done properly, unconventional gas and access to unconventional gas, a pipeline, can and will be assets to their economies and to their communities. And as I see it, there are three clear imperatives for the timely development of the potential of coal seam gas in Australia. First, from a policy perspective, the New South Wales Energy and Resources Minister, Chris Harcher, has noted that this state desperately needs gas for its electricity production. The choices in New South Wales are stark and they're pressing. You wouldn't know it from the media coverage. Dare I suggest it will be a bit like, you know, what we've seen, this pattern of the media telling people the sensationalist side, anything but the realities, and then when the realities catch up, the media at the head of the pack saying, oh, how did this happen? Well, what's going to happen in New South Wales, as as Martin Ferguson put it, if we don't get on with CSG, the lights are going to go out. You know the story. Do you think you can get that message over? The good people of Sydney running around with their no coal seam gas stickers on the back of their motor cars need to know that they've got some choices coming up. Cold showers, no air conditioning. The coffee percolator might sort of get interrupted in its cycle. There are choices that have to be made. You can't run away from them. They don't want nuclear. We're told, I'm sorry to offend some of you, they don't want any more coal-fired generation. Well, let's turn the lights off or get some of those gas projects going. In the end, two plus two equals four when I went to school. There are realities. You actually have to deal with facts. So I say to you, secondly, there's an economic imperative. The Australian economy has run up a cumulative trade deficit over a very substantial period. Exporting energy resources to regional trading partners can help us build wealth. It can help countries in the region develop the spending capacity to become attractive export markets for agricultural and other goods. Farmers have a particular interest in helping lift people out of poverty in the region. 
Here's a staggering figure for you. One Australian farmer feeds 600 people, but only 150 of them are in Australia. 450 of them are overseas, according to the National Farmers Federation. And it stands to reason that out of enlightened self-interest, farmers want them to be able to pay for good quality Australian produce. I make the point on the way through that Mick Keogh, nobody knows uh, farming from an intellectual perspective better than Mick Keogh, he makes the point that Australia, in fact, is, the, is the, one of the four most food secure nations in the world. And we are feeding vastly more people than we have here in Australia. Vastly more. And we can feed more if we have the right policies, including the right priced energy, fertilisers, chemicals, plastics and so forth. So finally, can I say the exploration, investment in and extraction of unconventional gas presents a significant opportunity for farmers as many are already discovering. It has the potential to reduce farmers' input costs significantly and to build stronger communities around additional employment opportunities, especially for young people. Investment and jobs equal regional development, something we've all wanted for decades. So I am convinced that whatever challenges developing coal seam gas may involve, it can be done responsibly and it will be a vital part of our future economic landscape. It rep represents an opportunity to contribute to preventing po poverty on a global scale as the world's fourth largest exporter of food and a chance to secure for ourselves greater growth, greater energy security and greater opportunities for families in rural Australia. So what needs to be done? It seems to me that four stakeholder groups need to come to the table to ensure that we don't snatch defeat from the jaws of victory on this one. Government, industry, farmers and the media. Firstly, governments. Frankly, they have a very difficult time ahead. It will be genuinely challenging to ensure the law finds a balance between encouraging investment and preserving both people's rights and the environment. Margaret Thatcher once commented that there's nothing more obstinate than a popular consensus. I do know how hard it is, how much political courage will be required to legislate on these controversial political issues. Vision, strong leadership and clear articulate communication that insists on scientific facts and not self-serving hyperbole is the only way forward on such matters and the only hope that the government has for productive leadership. Industry must work to engender real trust with farming communities around the country, not just consent on a case-by-case -case basis. This trust can only be earned over time and will depend on three things. Firstly, they must be of the highest integrity. Industry must be open about their operations, keep their commitment to impeccable health and environmental records and minimise the cost and damage of any mistakes that are made. And we all make mistakes. Secondly, they must keep channels of communication open with farming communities, even ones whose lands they aren't yet operating on. Being present to hear the concerns of farmers and addressing those concerns earnestly with all due respect is vital to a trusting relationship. Finally, I do think that industry can and should do more to better compensate farmers and ensure fair and generous recompense for land access. We don't have the same title arrangements as pertain in the United States where the shale wells that are going up everywhere on farmlands see the farmers extract around 25% of the value of the gas that is flowing because they have a direct interest in it. Freehold title doesn't give you that right in Australia. I have freehold title. But I do not own the minerals under the soil. For me to ask for them would be to ask for a massive transfer of wealth to me, and I couldn't look the people I went to Gunnedah South Primary School in the eye and say I've been fortunate enough to inherit and put together some valuable farming uh, land. Uh, now I want you to give me the mineral rights as well. I reckon that would be pretty rough. We don't do it that way. However, however, having said that, fair and generous recompense for land access seems to be critically important and only reasonable. And this should be a combination of upfront payment, in-kind works and some kind of annuity payment. With integrity, communication and compensation, industry will go a long way to building the necessary trust and cooperative spirit that is vital for sharing land in this country. Then there's we farmers. We need first and foremost to understand that critical as our role is, we are interdependent on other industries. We need to engage with the resource sector and with scientists and economists to understand our position in the bigger national picture. I'm a director of the Crawford Fund, the sole objective of which is to create a world in which people are sustainably fed. It brings me into contact regularly with scientists who despair at the current debate 
As one of them said to me recently, you can't do anything in our modern world without energy, let alone feed people. Might sound basic, but when you listen to some of the commentary around the place, it is very obvious that many people are totally unaware of it. There's this kind of understanding, this level of information and dialogue that will help us make the best decisions, not only for ourselves, but for our children and our country. It's also vitally important that farmers not just recognise challenges, but recognise opportunities. There are cutting edge farmers who are recognising real opportunities in the field of unconventional gas reserves on their property, but feel too intimidated to do so. In response to one such farmer who spoke out on ABC radio recently, the chair of the New South Wales Farmers Association, Fiona Simpson, stated that the association needs to respect and properly cater for those farmers who want to pursue opportunities to negotiate with energy companies. I want to say this is an important point. If the current land use negotiations in New South Wales are not carefully managed, cutting edge innovative farmers will, hold, will find themselves held back. They may even find their rights being unreasonably restricted. And as a former Minister for Primary Industry, I'm very aware of the importance of nurturing and encouraging leading edge farmers. They are the people who lead the remarkable ongoing productivity improvements that have been such a feature of Australian agriculture. Finally, it's incumbent upon farmers to avoid listening to hyperbole or engaging in it. I'm aware of three quite significant claims of environmental damage supposedly caused by the energy sector, which on closer examination proved not to have been caused by extraction processes, but by farming processes. These discoveries will not have been lost on the activists who have been using farmers as a human face for an agenda that is far removed from those same farmers' interests. In my opinion, farmers need cheap energy and unconventional gas provides an opportunity to source that energy. They need to be careful of aligning themselves with movements that are passionately opposed to cheap energy and the lower cost fertilisers, chemicals and plastics that are vital to farming and derived from cheap energy. The media is the intermediary for all of the above stakeholders and as a party responsible for keeping the public informed on this matter, must commit to facilitating an educated and civil debate. Sensationalist rhetoric or the consistent exposure of one particular entrenched standpoint will only serve to unhelpfully swing the debate away from the mutual aims of all parties and towards the entitled self-interest of one side. We cannot, my friends, allow ourselves to follow in Europe's footsteps where we expect everything to be given to us without laying the economic framework to provide the growth and prosperity that will enable a better standard of living of all. The consequences of that behaviour are becoming painfully clear as we speak. One last slide. We can bring them back up. Final slide, Chair. Final slide. I think it's actually the first. There, no. <laughs> Next. Next. That's it. I don't know how well you can see this. Hopefully reasonably well. Uh, but you will have heard that uh, you know, these figures, and, and indeed the previous speaker referred to debt as a proportion of GDP. We keep hearing that Greece has a debt of debt to GDP ratio of 166%. You've heard that? And that's the crisis, the, the problem they're grappling with. I don't know whether they still have a GDP to have it. <laughs> but anyway. Can you see that figure there that is Greece over towards your right? See the 166%? If you actually look at the unfunded liabilities, the cost of commitments they've made in terms of pension and health care and disability allowances and so forth, to their citizens but not funded, unfunded liabilities are over 800%. You come back to France, their debt to GDP, 99%, unfunded liabilities going forward, doesn't seem to worry their new socialist president, 549%. Even Germany, over 400%. America, 522%. 48% of Americans draw a welfare check. In 2012, on current rates of receipts, their federal budget will com be completely absorbed by the cost of interest on their debt and their welfare payments, leaving nothing over for all the other things governments are meant to do. That, those outcomes are the direct result of a loss of civil, thought through, considered debate, an environment in which everyone says it's about me and I want this, that and the other entitlement and I expect my children to pay for it, but I'm going to deny them the economic flexibility and so forth to make it happen. 
We do not want to inject into the heart of our political system the same problem. Because you'll see over there in the little red box, now I have to stress, these are a couple of years old, these figures. They are a couple of years old and they do not take into account what the states have been up to. Some have been responsible, one or two have not been. But if you say Greece's debt to GDP ratio is 166% and their unfunded liabilities 875, Australia's figures respectively two years ago were six and nine. We are a country in an unbelievably fortunate position. It reflects sound decision making, you wouldn't know it from the way people sometimes talk. Menzies said, we'll limit entitlements, you can't go aboard on pensions, you ought to be old before you get them. Certain other government introduced compulsory superannuation, there's an employer I didn't like it, but it gave us a means of funding those unfunded liabilities and crippling those other economies. The average tax take in the Eurozone to meet these commitments, assuming they can stop their economies from contracting, in 2020 will be equivalent to 50% to of their GDPs. Not doable. They are in a shocking mess. We are not. We have choices. We must ensure we have a civil and informed and fact-based public debate. The microcosm that we've seen surrounding gas is a perfect example, in my view, of how to end up in this sort of soup. Thank you very much.